Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today I'm going to present one of my videos from my new channel, Research Flat Moon. Now, this has been released over there, but I wanted to go ahead and put it up on my main channel to get it a little bit more exposure and maybe encourage you to go over and give me a like and a subscribe on my new channel. So, let's go ahead and go on with the presentation. This is one of Blue Marble Science's favorite arguments that QE makes, and that is his basic misunderstanding of the Coriolis effect. In order to have the Coriolis effect, you must have two frames of reference. You have to have a rotating, non-inertial frame of reference, and then you need another frame of reference in which you are measuring the non-inertial frame of reference to be able to tell that it's rotating. So for example, if you're going down the highway, and there's a car keeping pace with you on your left, you don't know for certain whether you are sitting still and parked next to that car, or you're going down the highway side by side at 70 miles an hour. So in other words, while those cars going down the road are moving, they are not moving in reference to each other. You need to evaluate that from another frame of reference, such as the police officer with a radar gun on the side of the road. Because you're looking at it from an outside frame of reference, you can tell whether those cars are simply parked next to each other or are going down the road at the same speed. You need that second frame of reference, and that is why you have to have two frames of reference. Now, QE likes to confuse this by saying that the Earth is a rotating frame of reference and the atmosphere is not a rotating frame of reference. That is not true the Earth and the atmosphere rotate together like those two cars going down the road at 70 miles an hour side by side. Now the purpose of the second frame of reference is to be able to determine whether the first frame of reference is moving or not. Now this is actually a true statement right here. If an object such as a helicopter lifted off of the Earth and did not move laterally in any direction, there would be no Coriolis effect. The reason that you get a Coriolis effect is that you have an object moving above that rotating frame of reference. Now, on the Earth, the rotational speed of the Earth at Alaska is different than the rotational speed of the Earth in Florida. And as a result, that if an aircraft is sitting on the runway in Alaska, it will have the rotation of the Earth at that point. Once it takes off, it will maintain that same rotation of the Earth unless an adjustment is made. And as the Earth rotates faster underneath it, the flight path would curve to the right. Now, this is not a consideration in aircraft because aircraft do not take off and then fly laser straight in one direction. They fly along a flight path with continuous corrections. And as they follow that flight path, part of their forward momentum is sideways momentum to stay on the flight path. And as a result, they pick up the speed as they go along. Much like if they passed over several airports on the route, they would have the same speed whether they were in the air above the airport or they were parked on the runway of the airport. They would assume the rotational speed of that point. Again, I've done a number of very good videos on this that explain this very well. Now, just to clarify the difference between wind, an artillery shell, and an airplane is that an airplane is under continuous control. Wind and artillery shells are on a ballistic trajectory. They have no way of maintaining a certain path over the ground. They just keep going in a straight line. And as a result, they do curve. That is why hurricanes rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. It is why we have trade winds, and it's why long-distance artillery requires a Coriolis correction when attempting to place a shell on a target 20 miles away. Even long-distance rifle shots of a thousand yards or so do require a correction for Coriolis of about two inches. In many cases, that minor correction of two inches at a thousand yards is less than the accuracy of the rifle and it's not that important. But if you have a precision rifle, you will need to make that sort of correction. It comes into play more often in artillery, which travels 5, 10, 15, 20 miles from the point of firing. 
Once again, this is a misuse of citations by Quantum Eraser. Let's go ahead and have a quick look. Now, like many of his citations, QE obviously never read this one. This citation that he's using is discussing the effects of the Coriolis effect on the Earth. It has absolutely nothing to do with saying that it doesn't exist or questioning its existence. It's simply telling you how it works, and it's a study guide for a test, probably on the high school level. Even though this discussion is about the Coriolis effect, he's trying to add something different in here, and that is flight times going east or going west being somehow different. Now, his argument here is that if you took a flight from Charlotte, North Carolina to Los Angeles, that it would somehow take a different amount of time going west to east or east to west. Now, indeed, we do get a shorter period of time when you're going west to east, but that is because the prevailing winds in that area go from west to east. So it speeds you up a little bit when you're heading east, and it slows you down with a headwind when you're going west. That's perfectly normal. Now, his argument is that the aircraft, as soon as it leaves the ground, immediately stops moving, and then somehow has to catch up to the rotational speed of the Earth. Now, here's the statement that demonstrates his absolute misunderstanding of this problem. When an aircraft takes off from Los Angeles or from Charlotte, North Carolina, it flies 500 miles an hour in relationship to the ground underneath it because the atmosphere moves in relationship to the ground underneath it and the aircraft flies through the atmosphere. So 500 miles an hour going west and 500 miles an hour going east is the same 500 miles an hour through the air. Now, in his erroneous thinking, he thinks that the airspeed of the aircraft and the speed of the Earth have to be added together to give you a total speed. Now, this is true if you're looking at it from an outside frame of reference. But remember, when the aircraft is sitting on the runway, it's doing 860 miles an hour in that same remote frame of reference. So once again, you can't make an argument against a model if you don't understand the model in the first place. The aircraft already has the rotational speed of the Earth imparted upon it by simply being on the ground as it takes off. Its speed between the two points is 500 miles an hour. This 860 miles an hour has absolutely nothing to do with it. So now he's trying to put out this law of non-contradiction. You know, I've got to tell you, it gives me a warm feeling inside when flat earthers try and use logical arguments to justify their silly narrative. Kind of like this rainbow unicorn kitten with butterfly wings does for the rest of you. As it turns out, he's about as good with the law of non-contradiction as he is with the modus tollens argument. Now, the law of non-contradiction says that you can't use two arguments that oppose each other within the same proof. For example, you could say that a human being is a primate. And another part of your argument would say a human being is not a primate. You can't have it both ways. That would be a violation of the law of non-contradiction. Now, this isn't a violation of the law of non-contradiction because there is no contradiction. Both the surface of the Earth and the atmosphere rotate. The problem that QE has is that he doesn't comprehend that fact. He believes that the surface of the Earth is a rotating frame of reference and the atmosphere is a non-rotating or inertial frame of reference. That's not the way it works, as we have pointed out. So rather than be a violation of the law of non-contradiction, it's simply a demonstration of his lack of insight and understanding between inertial and non-inertial frames of reference. Well, I think that's enough fun for today. Our next episode, which will be the final in this series, is my personal favorite, and that is, how do you have gas pressure next to the vacuum of space? Is it a violation of the second law of thermodynamics? Does quantum eraser even know what the second law of thermodynamics says and when it applies? So until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you again for stopping by. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe to my new channel.
so 